dig that new theme song, man. We are so hip here on the Chronic Rift. Hi, I'm Judy Fanari. Today we're going to babble, not only Keith will babble, but we all will babble about the bald guy and the one with the beard and the rest of the crew of the good ship Enterprise. Exactly what is next for the next generation? We'll talk about that later on, so stay tuned in. But before we can talk about the future, we have to talk about what's going on now. Make sense? Good. Arnold Schwarzenegger is getting a jump on all the other summer movies by releasing Total Recall on video in October. No, November. Makes a good stocking stuffer. Eh? Eh? Yes? Yes? For his fans? Maybe? Possibly? For 15 years, fans have been piling in at midnight to movie theaters to watch the now cult classic, The Rocky Horror Picture Show. Most of its appeal is the audience interaction with the characters. Now you can enjoy the film over and over and over and over again as it makes its way to video stores in October. 20th Century Fox claimed that the reason it took them so long to release the film was because it did not want to squash the success it had as a late night theater flick. Now here's the catch. It's on sale for one day for $99.99. Our first book note is October's release of Maps in a Mirror, the short fiction of Orson Scott Card. The collection includes tales of horror, fantasy, science fiction, philosophy, and Mormon life. Yes, Mormon life. It costs $19.95 in hardcover and includes the pre-novel versions of Ender's Game, Prentice Alvin, and Songmaster. These three will not appear in the later soft cover version. Also look for C.J. Chera's latest, Cher Neva. This is the sequel to Rascala, which is part of his fantasy series based on Russian folklore. At $18.95, it is being published by Del Rey Publishing. Ah, this week's memorable moment comes from one of our viewers, Albert Crescenzo. He writes, Dear Keith and Judy, I really enjoy the rift. He could be lying. And I wanted to suggest a memorable moment. A couple of friends of mine subject me to Doctor Who every week. This clip is my favorite moment in the show's history cause, nice English, Albert, I always thought Adric was a twerp. Sincerely, Albert Crescenzo. And remember, if you have a memorable moment or any other words of wisdom, send them to us here at the rift. Hurry, Doctor, we must get Adric off the freighter. The console's damaged. We must leave Adric just for a little time. entering a world of sight and four color panels. You've entered the comic art commentary zone. Dun, da, da, dun. Hi, Keith. Hi, Judy. <coughs> I said that first. I said it second. All right. I'm Keith DeGanzado, critic for the Comics Journal. This is Comic Art Commentary. 
With the growing popularity of comics has come a great deal of attention in the mainstream press. Some of it has been negative, such as a cover story in the New York Times Magazine last year which decried the, up, the uh, great amount of violence in mainstream comics, but most of it has been positive. There have been articles in such magazines as Rolling Stone, The Nation, Playboy, The Village Voice, and Library Journal. October 1990, we'll see three books being released on comic art as well. The first is Judith O'Sullivan's The Great American Comic Strip, which has two flaws with it. One is that O'Sullivan asserts that the comic strip was originated in this country, a popular, if erroneous, misconception. There were comic strips in mid-19th century European magazines. And also, O'Sullivan can't write very well. Her preferred style is old high cliché. However, her research is very impressive, and the illustrations, as one might expect, are fantastic. It's due in October from Little Brown, and this book is available for $50 in hardcover, $24.95 for the paperback. Dennis Gifford has compiled a tremendous reference work called American Comic Strip Collections, 1884 to 1939, The Evolutionary Phase. This is an incredible re reference book. There is, Gifford lists everything, including some tangential stuff, such as an illustrated Buster Brown novella listed in chronological order. He also has very detailed comments to go along with the entries. That is coming out from G.K. Hall, $50 also for the hardcover, no word yet on the paperback. The cheapest of these books is William W. Savage Jr.'s Comic Books and America, 1945 to 1954, a 1695 hardcover from the University of Oklahoma Press. This is amazingly the first book to cover the social history of the post-war era through the eyes of the comics that were published. Savage's study is very broad and general, although it is also very well researched, and will make a very good starting point for what one hopes will be a large body of work on the subject in the future. Finally, Fantagraphics Books Incorporated has put out a two-volume set called The Best Comics of the Decade, 1980 to 1990, edited by Gary Groth, Kim Thompson, and Robert Boyd. It includes representative samples from such luminaries as Peter Baggy, Linda Barry, Matt Groening, both Jaime and Gilbert Hernandez, Christine Kreitra, Carol Lay, Alan Moore, Harvey Picard, Dave Sim, and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of others. One could argue whether these are necessarily the best or not, but they're all pretty good. Each volume is available for $12.95 each uh, in paperback, $22.95 in hardcover, $39.95 for a hardcover that is signed by the cover artists. Matt Groening and Bill Griffith for the first volume, the Hernandez Brothers and R. Crumb for the second. This week's comic in review is Fever in Urbicant, written by Benoit Peter and drawn by Francois Chuitin. It is part of the creator's Cities of the Fantastic series and has been translated into English by Elizabeth Bell, Randy Lefissier, and Jean-Marc Lefissier. It was originally serialized in Dark Horse's European anthology Cheval Noir and is set in Urbicant, a city in the future that has technologically been regressed. There's no electricity and there's no mode of travel save walking. The city, which is in the midst of a wasteland, is divided by a river. And the main character, Eugène Robique, a, the urbitect of the city, wants to build a third bridge linking the north and south banks. However, the government wants the north and south separated for political reasons, and so they reject the bridge, thus ruining the aesthetics of Robique's project. Robique has brought an object, which he describes as an empty cubic structure with sides approximately 15 centimeters long. Then it starts to sprout stems. Then it starts to grow. It eventually sprouts into a latticework of cubic shapes, which looks sort of like scaffolding and is called the network by the locals, and it grows to encompass most of Urbicant, including linking the north and south banks. It functions independently of other, other structures, passing harmlessly through buildings and people in its path. Shui Ten, who comes from a family of architects, doesn't draw people very well in this book, but the true main characters of the story are the network and Urbicant, and he draws them superbly. Peter limits the focus to Robic and two minor supporting characters, and so the rapid and bizarre social and political changes that Urbicand undergoes as a result of the network are seen primarily through Robic's eyes, which makes it easier on both the writer and the reader. All in all, it is a very fascinating tale. Not spectacular, but very interesting and certainly worth picking up. Fever and Urbicand is a graphic novel published by NBM Publishing Company. 94 pages, $12.95, available at comic specialty shops, and maybe, if you're lucky, some bookstores. That's it for Comic Art Commentary this week. Next week, I'll be reviewing Kings in Disguise by James Vance and Dan Burr, as well as taking a very interesting look at the legal hassles that Revolutionary Comics has been having with New Kids on the Block. Wait a minute. What I was told minute? not to interrupt you. $50, $22.95. They're books. These are not comic books. These are book books. These are real books. 
There are also art books. Art books are always expensive. For those of you who don't know what she's talking about, she complained last week because I kept talking about things that were overwhelmingly expensive. But you know college students have no income? I know college students have no income. Uh -huh. What does that have to do with anything? How are they going to buy these books? Borrow from their parents. <laughs> That's what Go I do. On. Anyway, here's a clip we would like you to take a look at. We'll go back. I need more people. We need to retune the phasers again. We'll get them out of there. Commander, reading subspace field fluctuations from within the Borg ship. Looks like they're regenerating, restoring power. They could be capable of warp any minute. Is the deflector ready? It's ready. Will, he's alive. If we could get him back to the ship, I might be able to restore... This is our only chance to destroy them if they get back into warp. Our weapon is useless. We'll sabotage them again if we have to. We can't maintain power. We don't have the time. Prepare to fire. At least consult with Starfleet Command. Get Admiral Hansen on subspace. Belay that order, Lieutenant. There's no time. Sir, we are being hailed by the Borg. On screen. how the 1989-90 season ended for Star Trek The Next Generation, thus angering countless viewers who don't like being left in suspense for four months. The episode was called The Best of Both Worlds and was written by co-executive producer Michael Piller and directed by Cliff Bowl. This week, the new season will finally premiere and presumably will resolve this cliffhanger. The Next Generation has accomplished one thing its predecessor couldn't, a fourth season. Still, though one is tempted to compare the late 60s cult classic with the late 80s syndicated success, that's not what we're here for tonight though that may be fodder for a future roundtable discussion. Tonight we are concerned only with the newer show. We will be speculating upon the upcoming fourth season, where the writers and producers might go with the series, and reflecting on the first three. What was done right, what was done wrong, what should be left alone, what could be improved. With Judy and I to discuss this are three people who have had some connection or other with the show. Dave Stern, the co-editor of Pocket Book's line of Star Trek novels. Bob Greenberger, editor of DC Comics, editor of the monthly comic versions of both Star Trek and Star Trek The Next Generation, and co-author of the team novel Doomsday World, and returning for another go-round, Dwayne Brodnick, who discussed Quantum Leap on the Rift a few weeks back, and is a screenwriter who has submitted stories to Star Trek The Next Generation. Dwayne, I'd like to start by asking you to briefly describe the scripts that you sent in, um, and just tell us about the, ex the experience of submitting to Star Trek <laughs> The Next Generation. Well, describing all the script would take too long. Oh. Uh, originally, I had three completed scripts and five outlines, five possible outlines. They were all submitted, and only one was kept for a period of six months. And eventually, it was returned and rejected. And uh, as anybody would be hurt, I was disappointed. <laughs> uh, because having a script kept for that long gave you the you know, feeling that they were, it was going to sell. But Eventually, it was returned. Was any reason given why? No letter, no explanation, nothing. Just a stamp saying, received by Star Trek, October 1989. That was all that was on the uh, title page. Hmm. OK. Um, so either, Bob or Dave, might you have, as, as editors who work with Paramount and talk with Paramount, do you have any inside information that, uh, about the new season? Yes, but we're not allowed to tell you. <laughs> oh, well, OK. <laughs> Signed strict confidentiality agreements. That, ah, uh, okay. But uh, they haven't told us anything revolutionary. We don't really expect uh, any shocking developments for this season. I don't think. I mean, Rocky doesn't ditch Picard and like run away with the ship, like he's always wanted. Oh, well. or better yet, <laughs> better yet, they dump Riker and keep Shelby. Uh, well, actually, <laughs> at the uh, Star Trek convention in Los Angeles in June, it was stated on stage that Shelby would be back in an unspecified number of episodes. Oh. which has uh, fueled quite a bit of speculation. Mm. What was your opinion of her? 
I thought uh, she came across pretty well. Um, she certainly asked the right kinds of questions mm. and uh, sort of spoke as like a conscience for, for a lot of the fans, I think. She was a very strong character, which is something that they haven't had a lot of on the show. Very forceful point of view. Mm. I think that's true. That's, um, I think um, one of the reasons that, that Worf stands out besides the fact that He's a Klingon, he's bigger than everybody else, and he's got a ridge on his forehead is the fact that he's, he's a lot more mm -hmm. forceful. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you know where he stands on just about everything. You don't always... Sometimes that's good. You don't, I mean, not everybody should necessarily be that obvious about who they are. Mm -hmm. I think it works for like Captain Picard because he's the captain. He's sort of above everything. So you don't want to know what he's thinking all the time. But for some of the others, that, that's a little problematical. Problematic. Um, that too. <laughs> Um, what do you think of, how do you think the show, the show has been, in terms of syndication, very popular. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think it stands up to um, other television that's around right now? It's tough to compare a, a show prepared for first run syndication to primetime television because sometimes the budgets are not the same. You're dealing with fewer minutes per hour for telling the story. Uh, Star Trek stories run about 45 minutes compared to 48 or so for primetime television. Those three minutes can make quite a difference. I think one of the problems the show has suffered is that the first two seasons, the writers seem to have a particular problem writing for the teaser and five-act format that's required by syndication to constantly be breaking away for commercials. As a result, I think the writers have been writing stories that because the formula calls for them to be self-contained or not as deep and as thought-provoking as they could be compared to uh, other shows that are on uh, at, at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think they should have opted for the uh, more popular storytelling format of the 1980s with um, dangling subplots, um, telling a complete story perhaps within that hour time frame, but carrying over the subplots, the feelings that have been going on. There have been hints back and forth about how Troy and Worf dealt with one another after um, the episode The Offspring at the beginning of the second season, but they never talked about it. Uh, the second season had Dr. Pulaski tell Jordy there was a possibility that he could have a sight back, and he said, I have to think about it, and we're into the fourth season, and he's yet to answer her. He's She's gone. Thinking. Hmm. Well, that, uh, from what I heard, they were think one of the reasons a lot of the actors were clamoring to, as, as I think Jonathan Frakes put it, to get that banana clip off him. Mm -hmm. and, and they decided, and I think it was, a, it was a sensible decision to have him keep it because that, that it's a, it's, I think it's an important part of his character. Then have him make the decision as part of a story. Oh, well, yeah, that's the problem. The, thi the thing is that the characters are there, but you don't know enough about them. They are. I mean, you may know about their parents and, and whether or not they have pro you know, problems with their parents, as most of them seem to do, <laughs> but... Who doesn't? No, uh, the, no the, thing, the thing is is that they all like each other. There's no real um, problems. I mean, they brought Pulaski in to try and be more of a foil for Data, so, somebody with a bit of an edge, and what you got was somebody who softened her edges after about two, three, four episodes. Right. And that, that didn't serve anybody any good. You don't have any sort of group dynamic. Everybody gets along. They all play poker at night. Um, they all hang out and tend forward together. Um, it would be great to see them in off-duty outfits, doing off-duty things, perhaps with people from the civilian side of the ship or people, Make you know, who serve them. Make them more real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's something yeah. they neglected is the, what you said, the civilian portion of the ship. There's been very few episodes. There's only, only like one per season to deal with any sort of civilians of that. When they threaten to separate the saucer. Yeah, right. Yeah. But I mean, that, like the bonding, the episode that had the, the archaeologist who was killed dealt with that kid. And that was nice because you got to see some of the, the more family aspect and that was the relationships between people on the ship, which right. you don't see enough of. There's a thousand people on this ship. You know? right. they can and we only see the that. same seven every week, you know, mm -hmm. or eight, if O'Brien happens to be <laughs> you know. Oh, O'Brien is yeah. uh, yes. Yeah. Returning? Yes, he is. He, he, he will be Yay! Um, Colmini Watch Week, whatever. He's hey. coming back, folks. And we promised you him on the cover of this comic book. There he is. Yes. Edited Very by this gentleman, so we, right here. Know it's, we know it's true. We found him. We didn't forget him. No. And he's also going to be in the pilot of Equal Justice. No, he was. He was. He was. Which aired back in the spring. Yes. Hello. I don't, okay. watch, I don't watch too much television, so... Yeah. It's okay. Not enough people watch The Equal Justice either. Okay. Yeah, well, he was in that. He was a good show. We yeah. find him. 
found him. But, uh, no, he'll be back. He'll be doing a, a handful of episodes once again. He won't be back in, in mm. every episode capacity. Is Whoopi Goldberg going to be back? I know she's already doing Baghdad Cafe. I believe like her career so, suddenly, but you know. I think it, once again in a very limited number of episodes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, this is one of those silly questions that people ask when they talk about a show, but I'm, I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, what do you think... Um, well, I, I could either ask the favorite episode question or the favorite character <laughs> question. What do you guys think? The favorite character, the favorite episode? Ask the favorite episode. You like the... Okay, I'll ask the favorite episode question. Dave, what is your favorite episode of Star Trek The Next Generation? Well, uh, unsurprisingly, it's Yesterday's Enterprise, mm -hmm. which uh, I think is one of the few where they've, they've put the characters into the situations where you can see the, the, where they have conflicts where there are decisions to be made, decisions whose uh, the alternatives are not so obvious. In other words, there's not a, a, a pat thing, a pat right thing for the captain to decide to do in that episode, which if this is the one where the Enterprise from the past appears and, the and changes history to right, the war with right, the Klingons. Right. Right. For those of you who don't know things by For episode titles, right. yes. Uh, <laughs> and you had some really, really strong strong character stuff to two great new characters from the enterprise c the captain yes. and uh great acting the, the show looked great i think one of the guys on the show that that i'm friendly with is uh, mike akuda who does a lot of the artwork he told me they spent like the budget for two shows on that and it really looked it, it was yeah. incredible that's, that's i think one of the one of the high points of the show the production values on that show are fantastic absolutely Absolutely. Um, and what helps, because when, the, when there's something, when the production values aren't high, it's a distraction. It takes away from whatever is actually really happening when it shows as, as, as good at showing things like what they did in the series Enterprise. All the subtle changes in the mm -hmm. ship are really good and yeah. sensible. Um, and that kind of thing is good because then you're not distracted by the story itself. How about you, Judy? Pick a Q episode, any Q episode. You like Q? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You just like you. Yes. Okay. Bob. <laughs> um, okay. Like, Yesterday's Enterprise was a, is a real obvious choice. I'll pick a, a one, not not as obvious would be Measure of a Man, coming in the second season, an episode dealing with the fact that Data is a, is a sentient being and, and deserving of his own rights uh, as an individual. Um, I think it's one of the times where the next generation started to rise to the promise that, uh, people expected of it being Star Trek, uh, coming in the second season as it did about midway through, showed us, you know, the show could rise to the challenge. Uh, it gave us something to think about. It gave um, Patrick Stewart a good opportunity to emote. Um, I thought it used the crew as support in, in very good roles. Um, and I also think it gave us, you know, being Melinda Snodgrass's first script, it, it just gave us some really fine writing, which fortunately her influence stayed on for the second and then third seasons. And conflict too. Yes. And again, really strong points of view. Different characters mm -hmm. having different but equally justifiable points of yeah. view. And Absolutely. That's what, that's what makes for. Good I mean, drama the, the great conflict there was Picard and Riker facing off against yeah. each other in a court of law, and but both acquitting themselves advocate, quite yeah. well. Also, also just the general the the meeting with uh, Captain Lavoie, the the judge in the case, and the guy who wanted to dismantle Data and Picard. All three of them had very strong opinions, right. and they were butting heads constantly over Absolutely. that. And that's why there was a court case in the first place. Yeah. Your turn, Blaine. <laughs> well, I have to go along with yesterday's Enterprise, but I'm, it's a toss-up between two other scripts: the bonding and the offspring, right. because they were both family episodes. Mm -hmm. We got to see a different side of of the characters. We saw Wesley expressing his feeling towards Picard in the bond when his father died, blaming, yes. almost blaming Picard for what happened. And uh, the offspring, we saw Data almost experiencing fatherhood. Although he couldn't express love, you can almost, you almost got the feeling that he did. He did love his offspring. So in, in that sense, I like those two episodes for that. The woman who played uh, Lal was fantastic. Yes, yeah. she yeah. was she was phenomenal, and and Jonathan Frakes did a very good job directing. I was surprised. I was expecting disaster because mm. I I have never been impressed You're much. Expecting Star Trek Five. Yeah, <laughs> really. Um, because I've never yeah. been impressed with Frakes as an actor. 
Um, I think he's really got the least depth out of anybody on the show. He, What's funny is he, he in person, he's a, he's a very charming and witty he's individual. Really, yeah. Yeah, no, I've, I've seen him be interviewed, and he is. But I think, like, he has very limited range. He's good in casual scenes. Yeah. Like, scenes when they're all, like, loafing around 10 forward, or, you know, they're having fun at the poker scenes. Mm -hmm. Those he's good at, but whenever he's like, he's got a pose and the jaw sticking he's out. Got, and it's he's like, got nothing to do on the show. You know, they have two captains. Mm. And the, by necessity, they have Patrick Stewart is just such a phenomenal presence that any time yeah. there's a decision to be made, he's the one who's going to be making it. And so he's, he's not in a good position to, to shine. And actually, because they give him the opportunity to get to the... Oh, uh, to lead the away team missions, mm -hmm. and he's constantly picking the same crew members time and again. Yeah. You would think, as they're doing their investigations, they would be doing things other than giving dry recitations of the, of the statistics on the tricorders or looking around them. You would think there'd be a little byplay, a little um, conversationalness between them, particularly somebody who is as laid back as he is, like Jordy. You don't get any of that. It's very impersonal. You don't. Mm -hmm. um, you're being. They all seem to like each other, but you're not quite sure why, because they don't seem to have anything to talk about. Anything well, some to of them, share. Yeah, I think, like, they're the, the best of buddies, but you don't know why. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Jordy Data the friendship, I think, buddies. is the only. Because they say they're they the best are. of buddies. Uh -huh. Yeah. The Jordy Data but, friendship was developed right off. That's, I think, the most yes. legitimate yes. out of yeah. all of them, because the two of them have really. You've seen them doing things together, and you can understand why they have a good relationship. Yeah, and the rest of the time, um, the only time you really get closer, the poker games. But that's a group, and you're not yeah. quite sure why that group is there. Because yeah. they're supposed to be. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the script. Right. It's in yeah, the script. right. It's, a, it's the, the only the only time I like. Well, what I like I liked when they brought Warf into it because he didn't fit in at all with the poker game. I mean, because he was like, you know, raise fifty, that whole thing, and everybody's like, <laughs> go for the kill. And, yeah, that's yeah. Right. right. And he's got the huge pile of chips right. in front of him. Killer yeah. poker. Killer poker. <laughs> yes, Klingon Klingon poker. Nasty yeah. stuff. But, uh, Could be rewarding though. Yes. Yeah. Uh, from what I, uh, since we're wrapping up, I think. Yes, we are going to be doing uh, that very soon. One less comment. Just you know, <laughs> talking about the new season, and real quickly, it's that uh, some of the storylines that we have heard are continuing to be focusing on some of the individual characters. Um, there, there's a key data story upcoming in the first half dozen. There's an important wharf story I'm told about that's somewhere right beyond that. Um, they are playing off elements from the previous. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, Nothing else. They have a cliffhanger to resolve. Well, 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 that too. <laughs> but uh, no, they're trying to get into a lot of characters. The um, second episode of the season is a really strong Picard story. I'm told. Okay. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to thank you, gentlemen, for being yes. on the show thank again. Thank you. Um, well, he's been, been on the show. Been... Gentlemen that have been on the show, you're always on the show. You've That's never true. been on the show. Thank All you. Kinds of people. All right, next week we're going to talk about Frankenstein. Is it the first science fiction novel or the best way to revive Elvis? And I'd like to know, in a one-night stand. Who stands? Good night. Good Bye. afternoon. Whatever. <laughs>